Hello and welcome to the National Press Club Westpac Lunch and Address. I'm Mark Kenny from the ANU and I'm also Vice President of the Press Club. We'd like to acknowledge the original owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. If you're following us on Twitter, the discussion today, if you're following the discussion today, our Twitter handle is press, at Press Club Aust. Uh, can I also briefly uh, take this opportunity to register on behalf of the Press Club our strongest possible objection to the extended pre-charge detention of the Chinese-Australian journalist Chung Lei, yeah, yeah. Who, who we learned only yesterday has now been officially arrested in China some six months after being taken into custody. Our speaker today is Christina Keneally. She's Labor's deputy leader in the Senate and she was recently appointed as the shadow minister for accountability. Would you please welcome Senator Christina Keneally. Thank you very much, Mark, and through you to the members of the National Press Club for the opportunity to be here with you today. I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, pay my respect to elders past and present. And may I say, as a member of the Referendum Council uh, that uh, delivered the Uluru Statement from the heart, a unified expression and desire from Australia's First Peoples, that I look forward to the day when that statement is given effect by the Australian people being able to vote in a referendum to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution and to give them a voice to the Parliament. I'd also like to welcome my parliamentary colleagues and friends who are here today, Ed Husick, Andrew Lee, Alicia Payne, and my constant companion as a member of both the Senate leadership team and the COVID committee, Senator Katie Gallagher. We've actually sat at separate tables today so we can have a few meters of separation <laughs> from one another. Lovely to have you here, Katie. Well, no one goes into politics to be in opposition, especially not those of us on the Labour side a party of initiative and ideas, a party created and sustained by a belief in the power of government to improve people's lives. But so long as you are in opposition, you have a fundamental responsibility to hold the government to account, not just on issues of policy, but on issues of integrity. Now, two weeks ago, Anthony Albanese asked me to take on the portfolio of Shadow Minister for Accountability. And that means it's my job to call out every government rort and racket, every broken promise, every instance of the liberals and nationals pursuing their donors and their cronies ahead of the national interest. Now, I share that responsibility with Pat Conroy as the uh, shadow minister assisting on government accountability, and indeed with all of my Labour colleagues and with all members of the Federal Press Gallery. Because proper scrutiny and real accountability extends beyond the to and fro of parliamentary committees and the theatre of question time into the, the minds and the, the hearts of your listeners, your readers and your viewers. So I've come to the National Press Club today to talk about why integrity in politics matters. Why it matters to the health and the strength of our democracy. Why it matters to the state of our economy and the quality of Australians' lives. Because every dollar that is funneled into dodgy land deals and sports rorts splashed cash on executive bonuses for liberal mates is a dollar that can't be used to help to rebuild the Australian economy or to properly fund an aged care system marked by neglect or to help families battling the cost of living pressures, including the increasing cost of childcare. Well, now, I've been in politics long enough to know that there is a view out there that grift and graft and dodgy deals with donors is just par for the course, the nature of the beast, the cost of doing business. Factored in by voters, because you know, all political parties do it, all politicians are supposedly in it for themselves. And for that same reason, I've heard it argued that drawing attention to individual scandals and corruption and dishonesty and mismanagement only succeeds in damaging the standing of politics itself. But that's only half true. Exposing acts of corruption doesn't damage the standing of politics. Corruption itself does that. 
Even more so when corrupt acts go unpunished, when they're ignored or worse, rewarded. When there are seemingly no consequences for gross incompetence, no penalties for scandalous negligence, that's what undermines belief in the system and respect for the institution. And apathy in the face of incompetence and scandal has been a hallmark of this liberal government for eight years. Stuart Robert, dumped for using his ministerial position for private interest, now back as a minister. Despite the MyGov crash and the robo-debt disaster, he still has his job. In fact, he has been given responsibility for a key part of the vaccine rollout. Susan Lay, sacked from the front bench after an expensive scandal, now back as a minister. Michaelia Cash misled the Senate and refused to cooperate with the Australian Federal Police investigation. She's now been promoted to deputy leader in the Senate. Angus Taylor's had Grassgate, Watergate, the forged document affairs, and yet he still has his job. Christian Porter failed to deliver the religious freedom laws, hasn't delivered the government's integrity commission, and yet still has his job. Richard Colbeck, a grossly incompetent minister, who failed to act when the Royal Commission handed down an interim report titled Neglect, and who failed to act again when COVID hit residential aged care. 685 Australians died on his watch. Censured by the Senate, he still has his job. And when independent bodies like the Audit Office find problems as they have with the airport dodgy land deal or with sports rorts, Scott Morrison responds by cutting their funding. In the world of business, these examples of incompetence would be career ending. And a culture so lacking in accountability would have everyone talking about a change of CEO. In politics, the consequences stretch further than that. There are real world problems caused by a failure to uphold integrity in public life. Democracy has always derived its strength through the consent of the governed, the will of the people. And when that consent and that faith is undermined, democracy is weakened too. For all its virtues, Democracy is a fragile institution. We saw vivid proof of that last month when the US Capitol attacks, perpetrated by what President Biden rightly called domestic terrorists and far-right extremists. We see it too with the chilling effect of law enforcement and national security laws on freedom of press in this country. And it may seem a strange thing for someone who has spent 20 years in public life to say, but we must acknowledge that democracy is not always enduring. The country of my birth and the beacon of democracy around the world, the United States of America, must now rebuild many of the institutions and conventions that upheld its small d democratic government. What happened in the United States should be a jolt to all political parties in a liberal democracy to consider their responsibilities to preserve the sacred trust between voters, elected representatives, and government. The erosion of conventions and institutions in the United States, combined with the easy and emotive capacity of social media, disinformation, and foreign interference to sway voters, is a wake-up call that we must uphold and protect the bedrocks of Australian democracy, including an independent Australian Electoral Commission, compulsory voting, the rule of law, an independent judiciary, and independent law enforcement and national security agencies with appropriate oversight, especially on intrusive powers, freedom of the press and public interest journalism, freedoms of religion, association, and speech, oversight and accountability mechanisms provided by bodies like the Australian National Audit Office, Senate estimates, and state-based anti-integrity, or state-based integrity commissions. As Anthony Albanese noted in his vision statement on democracy in 2019, the University of Canberra found that satisfaction Australian democracy has halved in the last decade, down from 86% to 41%. The Lowy Institute found in uh, 2019 that 22% of Australians support the statement that in some circumstances, a non-democratic government is preferable. It was a shocking 30% of voters aged 18 to 29 who agreed with that statement. As Anthony said, that is dangerous. When the idealists lose support for democracy, cynicism wins and positive change stops. 
Distrust and disengagement allow failure to go unaddressed and self-interest to be served. In short, when cynicism grows, politicians like Scott Morrison flourish. It is much easier for a politician like Scott Morrison to serve his own political purposes if Australians have low expectations and cynical views of their government. While the long-term decline in trust in democracy is worrying and creates space for cynicism, it's also a fact that trust rebounded in 2020 when the pandemic hit and Australians turned to governments to keep them safe. Now, the national response to COVID shows that when the community and political leaders move together, we can still do really big things quickly to fix problems, to protect the vulnerable, and to improve people's lives. Now, when the pandemic hit, Labor sought to work constructively with the government. As leader of the opposition, Anthony wisely judged that what the Australian people wanted and needed was their parliamentarians to put aside partisan arguments and to ensure that health and economic support flowed as quickly as possible. The constructive approach, if I may say, that Anthony took stands in stark contrast to the oppositionist approach taken by the Liberals during the global financial crisis. But Anthony knew, especially after his many visits to bushfire struck communities last summer, that in a crisis, the most important duty of elected representatives is to deliver support quickly and to provide confidence to the Australian people that the parliament is on their side. That's why Labor offered constructive suggestions like a wage subsidy, and we supported job seeker and job keeper legislation quickly through the parliament. Where there were gaps, we looked for solutions, not arguments. Now, JobKeeper has been vital. That's why Labor proposed it in the first place. There are still 1.6 million Australians who depend on this lifeline. There's still a very long way to go in our economic recovery, and for many Australians, there is real fear about what's going to happen next month when JobKeeper ends. Because the biggest single threat to the Australian economy is this Liberal government re reverting to type. Already this year, we've seen the most radical regressive proposals for industrial relations since work choices. Blatant canvassing of junking an election promise and freezing superannuation. A prime ministerial commitment to cut job keeper and job seeker, cutting a lifeline for millions of businesses and families, and cutting Australia's recovery off at the knees. It's clear that the government has already flicked the switch from we're all in this together to you're all on your own. And the Prime Minister, while he is preparing the ground for an austerity agenda of cuts to pay, cuts to super, and cuts to support, continues to treat taxpayer money as if it is Liberal Party money. And the size and the scale of this scandal is not yet fully understood. Scott Morrison was up to his neck in sports rorts, more than $100 million of taxpayer money overwhelmingly benefiting marginal electorates in the lead up to the 2019 election. Scott Morrison didn't care about the thousands of community sports groups who deserved that funding and missed out. He was, all he was cared about was gaming the system to help his government. But understand this, sports rorts is no one off. It's also not the biggest nor the worst case of use and abuse of taxpayers' money for Liberal Party political purposes. My colleague, Shadow Minister Katie Gallagher, Shadow Minister for Finance, has analyzed the budget and uncovered that over the past six years, as Treasurer and now as Prime Minister, Scott Morrison has perfected the art of siphoning billions of dollars of public funds into special purpose funds, which, sitting as large pots of cash in the budget, stand ready to be deployed for politically convenient purposes particularly in the lead up to an election. At $100 million, sports rorts is just small fry compared to where the real game is. Let's just take one example, the community development grants. Now, these grants were established in 2013 under the Abbott government, a relatively modest $340 million. Scott Morrison, as treasurer, recognized the political benefit of sitting on large amounts of unallocated money in the budget. So Scott Morrison has topped up the community development grant program year after year, budget after budget, 
till it now sits at a whopping $2.5 billion. And no pesky color-coded spreadsheets here. The beauty of the Community Development Grants Program is that to apply for it, you have to be invited by the Morrison government. So, no prizes for guessing which electorates have done the best out of these grants. Overall, 70% of the funding has gone to coalition states. Last year alone, 75% of community development grant money went to coalition states. It's not just the massive, multi-billion dollar community uh, development grants and sports rorts that Scott Morrison has up his sleeve. He has topped up in the lead up to the 2019 election the $150 million female facilities and water safety program, no guidelines, no tenders, no application process. The funds went to 11 liberal and national seats. The $3 billion, $3 billion urban congestion fund, 83% of which went to coalition seats. There's also the $1 billion Building Better Regions funds, the $650 million Commuter Car Park fund, the $300 million Drought Communities fund, the $22 million Communities Environment Program, the $55 million Safer Communities fund. The list goes on and on. This is roaring on an industrial scale. Billions of dollars in public funds discreetly parked in the budget and given away, usually at the complete discretion of ministers because no one needs that pesky auditor to come around sniffing again. Money to be provided to hand-picked electorates when the electoral timing is right. This is the perfect pork barrel program, programmed into the budget year after year, normalizing a blatant misuse of taxpayer dollars for Liberal Party political purposes. But the use of taxpayer money as if it's Liberal Party money, extends beyond the billions of dollars in grants and rorts. While Scott Morrison cuts job keeper, job seeker, and cuts the wages of ordinary Australians, he makes sure his mates have access to good jobs and secure pay. Eight years after the election of this government, half of the ministers in Tony Abbott's first ministry have left Parliament and been well rewarded by their Liberal mates. Fifteen of the 30 ministers in Tony Abbott's first ministry have received appointments or other favours from the Liberal government, got jobs with organisations they used to work with as ministers, or they now lobby their colleagues for cash. That means right now Scott Morrison is quietly spending millions of taxpayer dollars to fund the lifestyles of former Abbott government ministers. And Jobs for Mates extends beyond giving a soft landing to former ministers. They're also the secret of contracts to Liberal Party connections and using government resources to prop up Liberal Party advertising. Eight years after this Liberal government's come in and Australians still don't know why they gave half a billion dollars to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, a tiny organization that never asked for the money and despite its name had no practical experience protecting the reef. Why millions of dollars of advertising and market research are being handed to, uh, to mates of Scott Morrison's, mates like the former Crosby Texture pollster, Jim Reed, who got $1 million to provide market research to inform Scott Morrison's Our Comeback campaign. The Morrison government refuses to release the publicly funded Reed research. Why a tiny company called Paladin registered to a beach shack on Kangaroo Island got a half billion dollar contract to run Peter Dutton's detention centers. Why the Morrison government paid 300 million dollars, excuse me, why the Morrison government paid 30 million dollars for land in the Leppington Triangle for the second Sydney airport when it was only worth 3 million. Why, while Australians were suffering from bushfires last year, Scott Morrison rolled out an advertising campaign that politicized the Australian Defence Force, a move that discomforted the chief of the ADF, Angus Campbell, or why last week the Liberal Party rolled out a social media campaign politicizing the COVID vaccine and the Secretary of the Health Department, Professor Brendan Murphy. Scott Morrison, or Scotty from Marketing, as he is sometimes known, is using $75 million of taxpayer money to fund his COVID recovery advertising blitz. $7 million to promote the failed, say, the failed COVID safe app and $15 million to fund that Our Comeback campaign, a campaign that has amounted to little more than an overworn and overused and now abandoned catchphrase in parliamentary question time. 
And this comes on top of the $140 million the Morrison government spent in 2019 to promote themselves. Wherever Scott Morrison goes, the marketing budget grows. So Scott Morrison can come up with a pithy marketing line about what he stands for, but when we look at his actions, we can see whose side he is on and whose side he is not. The Prime Minister announced in a media conference that his government would take responsibility for keeping older, vulnerable residents in aged care safe when COVID-19 hit. Scott Morrison knew our aged care system was in crisis before COVID hit. After all, the Royal Commission handed down its interim report in 2019. It detailed shocking and horrifying reports of our aged care system. Residents with maggots and open wounds, chemically restrained and left to lie in their own urine and excrement. The Royal Commission interim report says that there were 4,000 suspected or alleged assaults in one year and that up to half of Australia's frail older residents in aged care are malnourished. This is not some report about a third world country. This is what is happening in Scott Morrison's residential aged care system. And the that what is happening can be summed up in one word, the report's title, Neglect. As Treasurer Scott Morrison cut $1.7 billion from the aged care system. Yet since this Liberal government came to power eight years ago, it has spent $1 billion advertising to tell us what a great job they are doing. When COVID hit residential aged care, Scott Morrison wasn't on the side of older Australians and their families like he promised. We knew from what was already happening overseas that residents in aged care were particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. But yet what extra measures did the Morrison government take? None. No extra precaution, no personal protective equipment, no pandemic training. Surge workforce plans were developed too late. 685 aged care residents died of COVID-19, making Australia one of the worst places on earth for aged care death as a proportion of all COVID deaths. Families were separated from their loved ones. Aged care residents, our parents and our grandparents, they suffered, they died alone often with their families not even knowing that they had passed away. Now, over the past year, my colleagues and I have met with dozens of aged care workers throughout this crisis. They are the unsung heroes of Australia. They have sought at every turn to give older Australians the care, the dignity, and the protection that they deserve. Aged care workers in Australia are understaffed and underpaid. They are under-resourced. They know that the neglect that is detailed in the Royal Commission's report is a direct result of government futs, cuts and policy. An aged care worker with many years of experience, often a woman in her 50s or 60s, is quite likely to be paid less than a 19-year-old re retail worker in his first job. I acknowledge here today Jared Hayes from the Health Services Union. That union has launched a landmark case with the Fair Work Commission to get a proper pay rise for these caring and dedicated workers. Unfortunately, when it comes to jobs and wages and aged care, there is only one job that Scott Morrison's concerned about. In his reshuffle, the Prime Minister left Richard Colbeck in the aged care portfolio. A job for a mate was a higher priority for Scott Morrison than looking after the well-being of older Australians in residential aged care. How can older Australians and their families rely on the Morrison government to deliver on the recommendations of the Royal Commission when they have never been on their side. Scott Morrison also stood up in a media conference and announced that he would get Australians stranded overseas home by Christmas. As a member of the Senate uh, COVID committee, along with Senator Gallagher, we've heard story after story of distressed Australians stranded overseas. Working families like the Vowels from Newcastle and New South Wales, who were stranded for months in the United Kingdom with their five children, living out of a caravan in a, a relative's backyard, 
and about to lose their jobs and their homes back here in Australia. As Deanne Vowles said to the committee, it is mentally, financially, and physically detrimental. If you can get high paying actors and politicians and cricket players and even lobsters in and out of Australia, surely you can get hard working, good working Aussies home. Now I'm happy to say that the Vowles family did get home, but only after a lot of publicity generated by their appearance at the COVID committee. I mean, funny that pretty much every stranded Australian that appears at the COVID committee finds within a few days they've got a flight home. Katie and I have joked that we might have to have all 40,000 of them appear just so that we can get them back into the country. Now, Scott Morrison promised they'd all be home by Christmas, but they weren't. As Peter Stoyanovich Christie, whose husband and mother-in-law were stuck in Serbia, said to the committee, they are not stranded, they are abandoned. Abandoned. Scott Morrison is not on the side of stranded Australians. There is no plan for national quarantine. There is no national leadership. The man who brought a trophy of him for himself to celebrate his border management responsibility has vacated the space and insists that international borders are no longer a federal job. If you want to bring a horse into Australia, it's going to go into a federal quarantine facility. But if you are an Australian who wants to come into Australia, Scott Morrison has washed his hands of you. He doesn't want the political risk for quarantine. Better the premiers have it, he thinks. Scott Morrison's refusal to be responsible for international borders and quarantine is putting all Australian citizens, those stranded overseas and those here in Australia, at greater risk. Scott Morrison also stood up here at this very lectern last May and announced the Job Maker Plan. It really was breaking news. It was the first time the Federal Department of Employment had heard of it. I mean, we know the Prime Minister is always there for the headline and rarely there for the delivery, but even by Scott Morrison's standards, the Job Maker announcement was a triumph of, a, of announcement over delivery. Not only is Job Maker leaving ne nearly a million Australians behind from hiring subsidies, but now, the Morrison government's industrial relation bill, relations bill will make it easier for employers to cut Australians' wages. What's worse, the Prime Minister is using COVID as a cover for his industrial relations plan and his pay cut, and that is no way to thank the workers who got us through this pandemic. The Morrison government keeps insisting that their industrial relations bill won't mean a pay cut for workers. Scott Morrison and Christian Porter say that employers simply won't cut wages now, and even if they tried to, employees wouldn't agree to it anyway. Well, hello world. What did we see last week? Travel firm Hello World what wrote to their employees proposing pay cuts of up to 20% when JobKeeper ends in March. Hello World shows us two things in black and white. One, we can see what employers are willing to do when JobKeeper ends. The end of JobKeeper will be a trigger, and we should expect that more employers will look to cut wages, especially when the Morrison government's industrial relations bill makes it easier for them to do so. Two, it should come as no surprise that the first employer to propose a wage cut is a company that is headed up by a former Liberal Party treasurer. How can the Morrison government be looking after you and your pay and conditions when they're too busy looking after themselves and their mates. What choice do the Hello workers and other workers really have with two million Australians unemployed or underemployed? Of course workers feel vulnerable. For many of them, the choice will be the Morrison pay cut or no job at all. The Industrial Relations Bill isn't just a problem though for workers on JobKeeper, it is a problem for the wider economy. Right now, what the economy needs is for people to be spending money, but families won't spend money if they are worried about a pay cut. Scott Morrison and Christian Porter just assert, in a Trumpian fashion, in fact, that pay cuts won't happen if this bill passes. Well, as Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations, Relations Tony Burke points out, if you want to ensure that Australian workers don't get a pay cut, then don't legislate to allow it to happen. And if you think the pay cut will be isolated to a few companies, think again. It has the capacity to spread across entire industries. Consider this. Take a labor hire company with a small number of employees. That labor hire company gets a, a new agreement through under Scott Morrison's industrial relations bill and cuts the wages for workers. 
then that labor hire company starts to expand across that industry. In order to remain competitive, what are other employers in that industry going to do? Make no mistake, they're going to have to cut wages. Scott Morrison isn't on the side of Australian workers. Labor set a really simple test for this legislation. We said that we would support the changes if it delivered secure jobs with fair pay. This bill fails that test, and Labor will oppose it because Labor is on the side of Australian working families. Now, more than two years ago, Scott Morrison announced that he would establish a National Integrity Commission. He has not delivered it. All the Morrison government has produced is a draft bill for a weak, secretive and compromised commission that would cover up corruption, not expose it. In the years since Scott Morrison has made that announcement, the need for an integrity commission has only grown, grown stronger. The dodgy land deal in the Leppington Triangle, the cash for visas scandal, which has seen some individuals actually able to purchase Australian citizenship, and the explosion of discretionary grants without guidelines, application, transparency, and oversight. But Scott Morrison won't even allow the Commonwealth Integrity Commission bill to be debated in the parliament. It seems he wants the Australian people to be cynical about their government. It suits his political interest if Australians trust in government declines and transparency in government dims. It makes it easier for him to ignore what the Australian people want and need and look after his own interests. Being in government must be about more than self-interest. It must be about the national interest. Australians deserve a government that acts in their interest, that is on their side. No less than the future of Australian democracy and the capacity of government to make changes in the interests of people rests on integrity in government and trust between elected representatives and citizens. That's why as a major step to restoring integrity in our democratic system, Labor will create a strong and effective National Integrity Commission. Powerful, transparent, independent. With the powers and the independence and the resources of a standing Royal Commission. The pandemic is not an excuse to avoid an Integrity Commission. It is, in fact, a reason to have one. If anything, there is a heightened risk of corruption in the current environment with the prevalence of government contracts going out without tender and appointments to government boards and bodies being made without adequate transparency. A National Integrity Commission is more important now than ever. Building trust between governments and citizens also requires a robust freedom of the press, stronger protections for whistleblowers, and governments to take seriously their legal responsibility to respond to freedom of information requests. Now, Australia got through this pandemic as well as we did because in a moment of crisis, unions, employers, parliamentarians, and the people came together and we trusted one another. As this crisis passes and the recovery begins, Australians need and want a government that is on their side to rebuild an economy that works for them. Now, I might pause here and let you in just a little bit on the sausage making process. One of the reasons our slogan is on your side is because it unifies Labor's two key objectives in opposition. One, to present a positive plan for national reconstructions, focus solely on jobs, good, well-paying jobs, where pay and conditions are protected. And tomorrow in Brisbane, Anthony will lay out the next phase of that plan. And two, to hold the government to account for their waste, their mismanagement, and their scandals, and their use of taxpayer money as if it is Liberal Party money, all of which hurts Australian families. But also for their disregard for the fundamental aspects of democracy, transparency, accountability, and integrity in government. Labor is on the side of the Australian people who want and deserve transparency and integrity in their government. I mean, after all, how can the Morrison government be looking after you when they are so busy looking after themselves? So if you want good, secure jobs with fair paying conditions, labor is on your side. If you want a properly funded education and skills system that will prepare your children for the future workforce, labor is on your side. If you want more affordable childcare, labor is on your side. If you want Australia to become a renewable energy superpower, 
With lower emissions, lower energy prices and all the jobs that that brings, Labor is on your side. And if you want transparency and accountability in government, Labor is on your side. An Albanese Labor government will build a recovery where no one is held back and no one is left behind. Because Australians want and need more now, more than ever, a government that is on their side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Keneally. Um, and can I also thank you for the reference to the sausage making process as a host of a, um, a ANU podcast, Democracy Sausage. I, I like all references to uh, uh, awful tubes. Um, that was a deliberate reference. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I did it. my research. Um, can I also congratulate you on your post as uh, Shadow Minister for Government Accountability? It strikes me that that's one of the core functions of an opposition <laughs> to hold a, a government to account. Um, I'm wondering, does your remit also extend to designing systems that will improve mm. and ensure accountability under a Labor government? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. Uh, and as I have assured my parliamentary colleagues upon uh, Anthony's decision to appoint me to this role, that my job is not to uh, take over their responsibilities and their portfolios, but rather to assist them to amplify them. And the uh, uh, the responsibility, for example, for the National Integrity Commission, uh, its legislation and its detail sits with the Shadow Attorney General, uh, Mark Dreyfus. Uh, but uh, I think you have hit upon an important point here, is that it is not enough just to point out the scandals, the corruption, the mismanagement and the waste of the government, but also to advocate and propose how all governments should hold themselves to account to the people. And some of the things I mentioned in my speech that we, we haven't uh, yet had the time to, to propose and explore uh, in, in today uh, around uh, freedom of information uh, processes. I'm sure many people in the room here have experienced the joy of putting in a freedom of information request to the government and, and not getting a response or having it ignored. Uh, in my other capacity as Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, you know, I was uh, quite alarmed uh, to see the excoriation of the uh, uh, Information Commissioner uh, that, that he put upon the Department of Home Affairs for their absolute failure uh, to respond to or even understand freedom of information requests. Uh, robust protections for whistleblowers. Uh, and I'm, as a member of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, I was part of the uh, report that uh, delivered uh, greater contestability for journalist information warrants and stronger protections for public interest uh, journalism. These are all areas where Labor has, either through its committee work or through its advocacy, made clear the things that we would do differently uh, to ensure that we're building trust, extending sunlight, and holding up those important democratic principles of accountability, integrity, and transparency. Thank you. Next question from David Crow. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Senator Keneally, for your speech. Just on the National Integrity Commission, which you've, you've mentioned, there's a, a big difference between where the government stands and other, others mm. stand on how that commission yes. ever gets going, what it can do. Yeah. In the current form, as advanced by the government, it can't necessarily hold public hearings on most matters, can't initiate inquiries, would have to have it referred to it. Um, the definition of corruption is fairly narrow. It doesn't include criminal matters, for instance. These are all constraints that outside observers have criticised. Um, can you commit Labor to pushing for uh, a more powerful commission on all those fronts? Mm. And when we get to a Senate debate, assuming that we do sometime before the next election, um, would Labor basically oppose a National Integrity Commission that's too mm. weak? Mm and leave it to the crossbench to try and get what they can? Mm. Or do you think um, Labor would be better off accepting what it can get now in order to go to an election and promise a more powerful commission mm. under a Labor government? Uh, thank you, David, for the question. Uh, on the first part of it, it's fairly easy to say, yes, of course, Labor, uh, and we already have, advocated uh, for a much stronger, uh, transparent, uh, commission that's able to uh, both look at uh, historical acts of corruption, 
or suspected corruption, uh, as well as to be able to hold public uh, inquiries, make their own uh, uh, referrals. Uh, and in that, I can uh, point to, uh, during uh, my uh, time in the New South Wales Parliament, my observation about the success of the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. And I think the fact that it is able to hold public hearings, that it is able to make uh, its evidence uh, uh, transparently uh, able to be understood by the community is a key part to the community having confidence in the work that the Commission does and confidence when it finds that there are acts of corruption or indeed when they find, as they did uh, with the planning system, that there were no acts of corruption uh, in, in one particular inquiry. So I think that's fundamentally important. On the second part of your question, it, it assumes a lot of uh, uh, hypotheticals. Um, I, you know, and I don't think I can precisely answer it without knowing the, scape, the shape and the scope of a bill that might be before the parliament. Uh, but uh, we have been robust in our criticism of this government's weak bill. We, we, we endorse comments of people like Jeffrey Watson, the special um, uh, counsel to the ICAC, uh, who has observed that uh, this commission is weak uh, and, in, in fact, rather than expose corruption, it would actually allow it to be concealed. Just quickly on that, though, uh, the arguments for and against in respect of w whether you would vote for a weak commission are that sure. it, well, something is better than nothing, uh, yeah. but then there's also the argument that it, would, it might take the sting out of or the impetus out of any mm. public push for a commission if you go to a weak one. Absolutely. So you would have to make that judgment, presumably. Well, and you, uh, welcome to the life of a senator. <laughs> <laughs> that is constantly the judgment you have to make. Uh, and, but you, and that's why I don't want to give a, a, you know, an absence of a concrete piece of legislation uh, a firm decision, also because Penny Wong isn't here and uh, that will really be... <laughs> Katie and I uh, know the value of consulting our, our leader. Uh, however, um, <laughs> uh, however, uh, I think, uh, David, if I can say, uh, you have a great deal of confidence that the bill is going to make it to the Senate before the next election when the government won't even bring it on for a debate in the House of Representatives where they have the numbers. Tom Stainer. Senator, thank you for your speech. Uh, you spoke about the United States uh, mm. during your address. We've recently seen US President Joe Biden announce that he wants to drastically increase the cap of, of their intake of, of refugees. Uh, it seems to be in contrast to the Australian government here who has announced that it's going to scale back its increase during the pandemic. Uh, what do you think about this issue? Do you think the Australian government needs, needs to reconsider their approach on, on this matter and, and continue, consider uh, taking up more of this load? Mm. First of all, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the, um, the commitment made by President Biden, uh, not just in terms of uh, increasing the intake for that country, but also his determination to reunite the families who were separated at the border. Uh, of course, we will announce all of our policies prior to the election, but let's look at Labor's commitment at the last election on refugees and asylum seekers to increase the intake uh, and to deliver a community sponsorship program uh, for refugees. Now, that's hard to do when the borders are closed. I acknowledge the government's a decision in the last budget to recognize that it was difficult to bring people in across the border while the borders are closed, while only citizens uh, are effectively able to come into the country. Uh, that being said, the government's decision in the last budget is opaque. They, on the one hand, assert that it's a temporary measure but the budget would actually suggest it's an ongoing measure across the forward estimates because of the cuts that they are making to settlement programs and the like. Uh, I have an extraordinary concern for the vitality and capacity of our settlement system, uh, which is taking an increasingly complex load uh, in terms of refugees and asylum seekers, and particularly people who are here on temporary visas, people they were never previously asked to support. Um, to be able to, to survive and manage the cuts to their funding and to be there for uh, refugees and asylum seekers when we're able to start bringing them in across the border again. Uh, Network 10, Tegan George. 
Senator Tegan George from Network 10, thank you for your speech. Um, in that, you mentioned the government's IR legislation. We've heard that Labor is not keen to support it because uh, it will allow below award pay in certain circumstances. Does that mean that uh, you're against or don't think there will ever be a circumstance where below award is appropriate? We think a fair day's pay for a fair day's work is still a, a ideal we're striving for. You know, Scott Morrison said, if you have a go, you get a go. There's nothing fair in people having a go and getting cuts to their pay and their conditions. Understand this. The Industrial Relations Bill proposed by Scott Morrison and Christian Porter has a big black hole in the center of it. It rips off the better off test. It takes away the safety net. And who is going to fall to the ground but the Australian workers? So whether it's talking about taking away people's uh, right to get their fair award pay, whether it is taking away their right uh, to ensure that they are not missing out because of the better off overall test, this bill also legalizes wage theft. Let's make no mistake about it. Scott Morrison and, and Christian Porter get up and say, oh, it's going to make it easier for casuals to become permanent. That's not true either. This bill is unsupportable. Labor will not support it, and we will fight it. The Australian, Richard Ferguson. Sorry. Uh, Senator Richard Ferguson from The Australian, thanks very much for your speech. Um, Senator, you're in a very tight pre-selection contest mm. for the top uh, Senate ticket in New South Wales Labour with your colleague Deb O'Neill. Uh, would you consider a move to the lower house or is it the Senate or nothing for you at the next election? I'm not moving. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say this? You though? tried that already, didn't you? <laughs> I did. It was the uh, the uh, Ben along. Ben along. Uh, no. Uh, let me say this, Richard. Um, first of all, uh, I would be an honour to represent Labor at the next election. Secondly, you know, I've known Deb for 20 years. She's a fantastic representative for the people of New South Wales. She always works hard to represent their interests. But thirdly, you know, with two million Australians unemployed or underemployed with 1.6 million Australians still relying on JobKeeper. The only job I'm really interested in is a secure job for Australian workers, and that's what my focus is. Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Fin, thank you. Um, one of the, in the lead up to the last election, one of the debates within Labor about was about, and this is, goes to a question about with your home affairs portfolio, one of the debates within Labor was about whether to keep the, the home affairs super department after mm. it was created. Uh, Bill Shorten ended up saying, I will keep it, but there might be some changes and mm. things like that. I was just wondering, given the, po the parties put every policy under review, is mm. that a policy that is under review or are you committed to keeping home affairs in its, mm. uh, in its role? And, and given with what we've seen in the pandemic, do you think there is perhaps a room to maybe um, to reshape or restructure sort of um, perhaps it's some of its remit or anything like that. Yeah, thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, one, as Anthony uh, Albanese made clear when he announced the reshuffle, uh, that uh, the arrangements that he has in place in terms of portfolio, so for example, I hold the Home Affairs portfolio, uh, is to ensure that we uh, best uh, match the government in terms of our accountability responsibilities. But he's indicated that is not necessarily the arrangements we will have in government. Uh, secondly, as the Shadow Minister for Home Affairs, it's my observation and it's the evidence shows uh, that uh, so far the Department of Home Affairs has not lived up to all the promises uh, that it was meant to deliver in terms of efficiency uh, of operation. Uh, and thirdly, um, uh, the, uh, the Department of Home Affairs uh, is a, well, there's no other way to put this, it's a diabolical mess. Uh, in terms of things like uh, satisfaction. It ranked uh, dead last out of all public sector agencies for employee satisfaction. Some 30% of the people who work in the Department of Home Affairs say they would rather work somewhere else. Uh, it has uh, incredibly poor functioning when it comes to things like FOI. Uh, and there has been a uh, extraordinary turnover in the department, meaning there's been a loss of capacity. 
uh, particularly when it comes to processing citizenship, visas, uh, and uh, supporting settlement services. So I'm quite concerned about the, the vitality or the, the, the capacity of that organization. Uh, and lastly, I see little evidence uh, that the um, supposed superstructure of bringing every national security agency uh, conceivable under one umbrella, uh, whilst main supposedly maintaining their independence, uh, is actually creating anything that is more effective than what was there before. Uh, so I suppose you could take that as uh, there, this is a, we are keeping a very close watching brief uh, and uh, there are plenty of things to be done when we come to government to fix up the Department of Home Affairs. Thank you. Sky News is Tom Connell. Tom Connell from Sky News. Uh, Senator, just a couple of your criticisms were of the Audit Office effective cut and advertising spend. So would you restore the full funding for the Audit mm -hmm. Office? And what would you do? A billion dollars you said Scott Morrison spent, so what would Labor spend on advertising if it wins government? <laughs> First of all, I now feel like this might be a revenge question for all those crosses on To The Point to Tom Connell. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thanks for the question, Tom. Um, one, I'm not going to make any spending commitments here without them going through the Expenditure Review Committee and uh, the Shadow Minister for Finance, Katie Gallagher, but I think it's pretty clear that uh, we are quite critical of the audit office cut uh, and uh, want to see robust integrity and oversight agencies properly supported. Um, uh, that's a hypothetical question and a slightly cheeky one about what would Labor spend on advertising. I tell you what we wouldn't do. We wouldn't be have, handing out advertising contracts without tenders. We wouldn't be uh, commissioning market research reports uh, without, uh, uh, without tenders. Uh, we wouldn't be seeking to keep those things uh, p uh, secret from the public. Uh, these are the things that undermine trust uh, in government. Uh, and when you've got uh, liberal aligned agencies getting contracts from a liberal government without oversight or tenders, then you've got a problem. And that's where you need sunlight and accountability. The West Australian, Sarah Eisen. Sarah Eisen from the West Australian. Just on your comments regarding quarantine and the federal responsibility, obviously in WA um, the state government's quite interested in if Christmas Island could be used again a, a federally, you yeah. know, and for the federal government to come into that. Scott Morrison recently said, listen, that's just not a possibility. Do you agree? Do you think that from what we've seen from um, how that facility has been used at the very beginning of the pandemic, it definitely can't be used again? What are your thoughts? Does it need to be back on the table? There are a lot of things that need to be on the table when it comes to national quarantine, uh, and most of them are in Jane Halton's report. You know, last year, Scott Morrison got briefed in August by Jane Halton. He's been briefed three times now about her national review of hotel quarantine. She made the observation that it is unsustainable, the system that we are running. Uh, she made the recommendation that the federal government should set up a national quarantine system in order to bring home to deal with surge capacity, she called it, to bring home the stranded Australians before the Northern Hemisphere um, winter hit. Uh, she made mention of several um, uh, Air Force bases that could be used. Uh, she made clear that quarantine can be operated under a federal system. I mean, the, the great vanishing act of Scott Morrison during this COVID crisis is extraordinary. The extent to which he has pulled the wool over the eyes of the Australian people and has tried to pretend that quarantine suddenly has nothing to do with him, nothing to do with the federal government. When we look back at this crisis, as Richard Marles observed on Sunday, when we look back at this crisis, the one thing we will notice is the absence of the federal government. Scott Morrison is the first prime minister since Federation at a time of crisis to shrink the federal presence, to shrink the national government's leadership. At a time of crisis, Australians look to their national government. I tell you what, stranded Australians are looking to their national government and they feel abandoned. Now you specifically ask about Christmas Island. There is a practical challenge right now with using Christmas Island. And that is that the government have moved people who are preparing for deportation for Section 501 character um, can visa cancellations to Christmas Island. 
because they can't be deported for one reason or another due to border closures around the world or restrict COVID restrictions. So there's a practical challenge to that particular facility in that it's being used for some other purpose. But let's go back to the beginning of this pandemic and remember that when there were Australians on the uh, Diamond Princess in Japan, when there were Australians in Wuhan and needed to come home, the federal government brought them home. The federal government put them into federal quarantine. But when it became clear the scale and the scope of this, uh, this pandemic, Scott Morrison did what he always does. He ducked the responsibility. He's hidden behind the premiers. He's made it their problem. He doesn't want the political risk for quarantine. And it's gobsmacking in his audacity. Year after year, Scott Morrison stood up and proclaimed he was the guy that could manage Australia's borders. He's now the guy that's abandoned Australia's borders. Do you think that being used as that detention facility is a convenient way to shirk that responsibility? No, in fact, I uh, acknowledge that if we had the unusual circumstance as people were coming out of prison, they needed to go into an immigration detention facility. So we had an unusual problem in that while the borders were closed, the population of immigration detention centres was actually growing. And in order to manage COVID risk in immigration detention, you need to be able to maintain uh, social distancing, physical spacing, etc. cetera. Uh, so I acknowledge that there is a legitimate problem the government is trying to resolve with a growing uh, immigration det uh, detention population as a result of border closures. Amy Ramikis from The Guardian. Thank you, Senator, for your speech. You said an Albanese Labor government will build a recovery where no one is held back and no one is left behind. But how can Labor promise to leave no one, to leave no one behind when you're already looking at cost cutting? Cost cutting? Hmm. Well, we know that ahead of any national conference, you look for cuts that can be made to the budget so you can pay for things. We know that the budget is pretty tight at the moment. We know that your leader has asked for each shadow minister to send forward their cost cuts. How do you make those cuts and at the same time promise that no one, which in this new world includes self-funded retirees and pensioners, as well as the traditional people we see as being vulnerable, being left behind? I, I'm glad you, uh, I wanted you to flesh that question out a bit more. Because Just making sure I knew my stuff. No, no. I've done my research. I know you know your stuff. <laughs> I wanted to see if you were going to mention the uh, directive that was in the paper that shadow ministers uh, should... Uh, shadow ministers do job. Do their job. <laughs> identify uh, objectives that support working families. Be strategic in the policies they're developing. Be responsible in the decisions they're making about funding commitments. I mean, if that's the charge against us, guilty is charged. That's what we're doing. But how can you Be promise to leave that. nobody behind in that world? I, I just gave a, a fairly long speech uh, that detailed the billions of dollars that this government is siphoning off to use for its political purposes. The way that it is using and wasting money. Let's take that Great Barrier Reef grant alone. Half a billion dollars given out in a 30-minute meeting to an organization that had about six employees and didn't even know what the meeting was about. The Prime Minister of the day, Malcolm Turnbull, walked in and said, would you like half a billion dollars? And they said, of course, yes, please. I mean, Jared, I don't know about you, but I think aged care workers would be delighted if the Prime Minister walked in and said, would you like half a billion dollars? You know, half your luck. They hit the jackpot that day, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. I don't begrudge them for taking the money, but I begrudge as hell the government for giving it out in such a wasteful way. But given so much uh, of look, that I, is Look, I think we'll have to leave that there, Amy. How do you we, do it? Amy, we're going to have to leave that there. I'm sorry. Enough, we've got well. one question to go, and we're getting well very done. close to the time. <laughs> Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. Hi. Can I take you up on, on something similar? You mentioned, for example, that half of Tony Abbott's first ministry mm. have got appointments at the moment. The implication is 
that's I inappropriate. Mm. Um, do, does that mean that a Labor government, an Albanese Labor government, would eschew and guarantee that no Labor members of Parliament yeah. or former ministers will ever be appointed to places? Or if so, would you say 25%? What's the right <laughs> amount? It's a, it's a fair question. It is a fair question. And if I were in your shoes, I would have asked the same question. And, and of course, I'm not going to say we'll never appoint a, a former uh, member of Parliament to a position. And you know, I'm going to acknowledge right now that there are some cases and um, uh, where, for example, I think Joe Hockey did a pretty good job as American ambassador. I actually think it was useful to have somebody who had political nows. Who could play golf. <laughs> who had Greg? Who had? Um, Could had you choose Greg another Norman's example, perhaps? Well, no. My point being that sometimes it is useful to have someone who has political context in certain roles. But just to to stack the AAT with political party junkies, uh, to be uh, to be appointing people like uh, Andrew Andrew Crone, is it Crony? You know, who's, who's got now, I think, over half a, uh, half, he's got a $500,000 job. Uh, uh, Shane Stone, uh, former president of the Liberal Party, is getting paid the same as the prime minister in a government-appointed job. I mean, these are, there, there is a jobs for mates mentality that is happening here. And so Labor could, would me, never do this. Let me, <laughs> let me put it this way. Let me contrast, let me contrast the way in which Scott Morrison looks after his Liberal Party mates with well-paid jobs, with his, his pursuit of the penniless during the robo-debt. Now, here you have people who supposedly got an overpayment of taxpayer dollars in their Social Security support. Their punitive pursuit of the penniless, some of them to their death, in what has turned out to be an illegal scheme, contrast that with their approach to jobs for mates, hundreds of thousands of dollars given out to political mates, companies who got JobKeeper support, who then turned a profit, they don't have to give the money back. Shane Stone, Shane Stone, who I mentioned, the job he got was advertised at $434,000 with a $100,000 bonus. He got the $100,000 bonus. That's my point. Whose side are they on? They're on the side of their mates. They are not on the side of ordinary Australians. How can they be looking after ordinary Australians when they are too busy looking after themselves and their mates? Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in thanking Senator Christina Keneally?